welcome back to SPQR Bootcamp. In this video, we're going to be doing the advanced rules. In the first video, you've had a chance to see how movement works, how melee action works, ranged attack, and how cover works. In today's video, we're going to talk about challenges, charging, dual weapons, falling, hit and run, knockdowns, and then we're going to talk about the equipment. We'll even mention the phalanx. All right, challenges. When heroes meet on the battlefield, they can be a titanic clash of arms. The lesser soldiers are advised to keep clear. Some heroes deliberately go looking for enemy leaders, calling them out to face them in single combat. Any hero involved in close combat may issue a challenge as part of its own melee action. It may be answered by any one hero of the opposing player's choice who is involved in the same close combat. However, if one or more heroes are present and none answer the challenge, all are placed towards the rear of the unit and may not take part in the close combat at all until they are the only models left, or they issue their own challenge as part of their melee actions. They are, of course, free to flee. If I have a hero who has joined, we haven't talked about this yet, has joined a unit, and this hero has joined this unit, and let's say as a second move action, we use a melee action to move in to base to base with these guys, and these guys are trying to get into contact, but they're too far away. This is considered one, this unit moved in, it's considered one melee action. These two are involved in this melee action. He can challenge, as part of that action, he can challenge any hero in this combat, which just happens to be only one, if he refuses the challenge, you put we don't just pick him up and move him back because that robs him of someone to fight. Take the farthest guy and switch them. That's what I think you should do. If the challenge is accepted, place the two heroes in contact with each other. They fight independently from any other models involved in close combat. They cannot be harmed by any other models and cannot take attacks against any models except the hero they're facing. If one side or the other has more models, in this case it would be the Romans, its hero may reroll any one melee or armor check during the challenge. Basically, one of the other guys helps block for him or... Uh, pushes him forward to get an extra attack, you know, the reroll his attack. The challenge will go on until one hero has been defeated by the other. In addition, note that it is possible to issue a challenge even if two enemy heroes are the only ones involved in the close combat. They're obviously old rivals and have scores to settle. It is not possible for one hero to avoid the challenge because you're going to swap places with the other guy. you got to stay in base to base. There is no one to hide behind. So basically, these two guys and these two guys would fight, and then these two guys would fight against each other. If he did like 15 wounds, they would all go on this one guy, and he would die horrible. But if these two guys did 15 wounds, then they would kill all five of those guys. Because remember, these guys remove casualties from the back First, working your way forward. Let's get rid of the heroes. We don't need to talk about that. We're going to talk about charging. And you said, Mr. Everything, we've already talked about moving forward, engaging in combat. Yes, but now we're talking about charging. If, when moving a unit into close combat, all of your models are able to move in a straight line before contacting the enemy unit, you gain a bonus for charging because you get momentum. It gives you a lethal plus one. The lethal ability plus one basically increases your lethal ability. Basically, all lethal does is negate one of your 
enemy's armor. So if he has an armor, armor of plus one and you have a lethal of plus one, he basically has no armor, or I should say an armor plus zero. If you already have the lethal rule, it just adds one to it, so you become a lethal two in that case. You have to move at least three inches in a straight line to get the bonus. And here's the trick, in a straight line. So this guy is moving at least three inches in a straight line. He charged. He's within six. He charged. He's within six. He charged. It's a straight line. He charged. These guys, well, they don't even make contact. But if you had a way, six inches would get you into combat by running around here like this, that's not a charge. It has to be at least three inches in a straight line. Now there is dual weapon fighting. Whether it's a matter of wanting to deal twice as much damage or just pure style, some warriors opt to take and use two close combat weapons in battle. A unit wielding two close combat weapons at the same time gains a bonus melee die and can choose which weapon to use during melee and can switch between the two. And a unit using two close combat weapons obviously cannot use a shield. Yeah, so it gives you an extra die on the attack. Not all units can do dual wielding. You have to look that up in your army lists. Falling. Remember in the first video we talked about jumping gaps? Well, if you miss that agility roll, you fall down in that gap. And depending on how deep the gap is, how many inches that gap is, if it's four or less, you take zero. A six to 10 takes two wounds. 10 to 15 is four wounds. And if you fall more than 15 inches, you are dead, no matter how many wounds you have. It says an agility check can be made to have the damage round up. So if you take one, you half it to 0.5, you round up to one. Hit and run units. The kings of the battlefield are heavy infantry and cavalry, but lighter troops will almost always be present. Light cavalry and skirmishers on foot fulfill an important role when they must always be wary of getting trapped by heavier units. A unit listed as being hit and run in a warband uses these following rules. If an enemy performs a melee action to get into close combat, the hit and run unit may attempt to flee. As soon as the melee action is declared, the hit and run unit may make a bravery check. If successful, it immediately performs a free move action. The enemy unit then completes its melee action, but now it's likely to be out of range. Hit and run units can only perform this move action once. Okay, there's something about knockdowns. Some attacks are so powerful, they literally knock a hero off his feet. Cavalry units are immune to knockdown. If a unit is knocked down, it's laid on the side. It has to take a move or melee action to stand up, but then it doesn't move any inches. And while it's prone, until it's standing, it'll suffer a minus two penalties on all checks it is called upon to make. Leading units. This game is kind of about warbands and heroes. So let's say we got a hero here and we got our warband there. A single hero may lead a friendly unit simply by taking a move action and moving within one inch of a friendly model in a friendly unit that is yet to take any actions. If they have not taken any actions, he can move into that unit. He then immediately counts as being part of that unit in every way. And then the unit may now perform its own action with the hero within it. So hypothetically, let's say he's back here. He uses a move action. Then he uses his second move action to get within one inch. Then they use their move action, pulling him along and then they can make a melee action. If they do, he is also performing the melee move action with those. And at what point he can do a declare. So technically, he could move four times. But then again, he is a hero. The special rule applies. Heroes make all their attacks separately, but is assumed to be taking part in its own attacks 
and will gain the, gain the normal bonus if the unit number is 10 or more. As heroes tend to have better ranged melee scores, you may find it quicker to roll his attacks with the rest of the unit, but use different colored dice. He has to follow the same actions as the rest of the unit, talents permitted. The hero abides by any special rules possessed by the unit. However, he does not pass any special rules he possesses to the unit, unless specifically stated. The unit can use the hero's bravery score for will to fight checks. Heroes may not be picked out by an enemy's ranged attack, unless the attacker is also a hero. And a hero can leave a unit at the start of any phase by performing a move action. So heroes pretty much, if once this unit moves, he can't move away. He's stuck with the unit. If this unit moves before he moves to join, he can't join. This guy has to move before that guy does any actions, and he can't leave once this unit has done action. Stunning. Several weapons and talents can stun an opponent, rendering them insensible for a short time. A unit will lose one action on its next phase for every stun it suffers. Until it can perform an action, a unit counts as rolling one for every agility and melee check it is required to make. I stun you. You can still move. If I cause one stun to this unit, the unit has two actions. It just loses one of them. So it can move up and attack or what have you. And it won't get a minus because it was able to move. But if I stun a unit and then charge in an attack, remember you get to counterattack but when you counterattack, you automatically miss because you're automatically considered to have rolled a one. All right, now weapons on your weapon charts or on your unit charts, unit cards, they have special abilities written on these cards. You absolutely do not have to have these cards. These abilities are in the army list in the back of the book. You can make your own cards. You can use a 3x5 card, you can scratch whatever down, but you've got abilities like Shield Wall and Testudo, or the weapons might have a specific ability. And here they are. Weapon Special Rules. Inaccurate. If it's shoddy, it has to reroll successful attacks. Lethal X. I talked about lethal already. It reduces your armor. It also counts as how many wounds it does. So a lethal two, remember these guys that charged in straight ahead, they got a plus one lethal. If they already had lethal and it became lethal two, not only does that subtract two from their armor, but every hit also does two wounds. However, a lethal weapon cannot remove more than one model from a single successful attack unless it's wielded by a hero. Uh, how would that come into play with these guys? They would charge and they would just kill the guy, obviously. But if they were Spartans and they had two wounds each, when he killed him, then he would still successfully remove a Spartan. Okay, long. Weapons with reach, such as spears, allow the wielder to keep attackers at bay. A unit using a long weapon gets a plus one to its melee checks when fighting an enemy who does not also have a long or very long weapon. The Sarissa is considered a very long weapon. They don't have very long weapons, so they would get the plus one in melee because their weapons are longer. One-shot. Javelins, pylums, things like that are one-shots. So when you use them, they're, they're gone. Parry X. A weapon is well-suited for knocking aside an enemy's attacks. You can force your opponent to re-roll one of its melee checks for every model in the unit that has this special rule. If the number follows the term parry, okay, if a number follows the term parry, this is how many melee checks an opponent is forced to reroll. A unit with numerous weapons and or talents that grant the parry rule 
may use all of them in a close combat, potentially rerolling several or all of its opponent's melee chips. Some equipment, such as shields, also allow you to parry ranged attacks. Remember, you cannot reroll a reroll. So if a unit has more parries than an enemy has attacks, the remainder cannot be used. With the errata, I believe you still get all of your parries. So if he gets two parries for his shield and one parry for his sword, or a total of three parries, this unit has six models. It would have 18 parries. So this guy charges in, this guy charges in, and let's say these guys don't make it. They're close, but they don't make it. Remember, only these two guys are fighting. They attack. They each get one hit. Well, those two hits have to be re-rolled, and if, by the miracle of who knows what, let's say they were able to get more than 18 hits, they would still have to re-roll 18. Even though these two guys aren't actually in the fight, remember the fact that when you remove a casualty, you take it from the farthest guy? Well, maybe he doesn't want to die. Short. Weapons without reach, such as daggers and knives, grant a great advantage to an enemy. They get a minus one to hit slow. Some weapons are difficult to use and require a special action immediately beforehand. Smasher, like a big club. It's heavy and brutal when swung with force. Impossible to stop. Cannot be parried by any means. Two-handed. Requires two hands, properly wielded, and may not be used with a shield or second weapon, nor may be used in dual weapon. Very long. It gives you a plus one if you don't have a long, a very long. Weak. This weapon is blunt or it delivers little force. You get a plus one to your armor. So various weapons in the world have various characteristics attached to them. Will to fight. Even though this battle-hardened warrior knows that it is sometimes better to run than to fight. At various points in a fight, a unit will be called upon to make a will to fight check. This is done by rolling a die and adding the bravery score. If the result totals six or more, then the unit toughs out whatever adversary it faces. If the check is failed, then a number of models are immediately removed from the unit equal to the amount by which the will to fight check failed. They run away. So there's a few of them that just break off and run. Heroes may always opt not to take a will to fight check, choosing to fight till a bitter end. If a hero is in a unit and the unit has to make a will to fight, he will give them his bravery, but he cannot force them or he cannot require them not to make the roll. Throughout SPQR, there are times when a will to fight check must be made. If a unit has line of sight and is within 12 inches of a friendly hero who is removed as a casualty. Got to make that will to fight. If a unit's warband is reduced to one quarter of its original starting models, rounded down. So if you had 10, one quarter would be 25, or two and a half, rounded down to two. So as soon as you're reduced to two, you gotta make that rule. If a unit is reduced to half or a quarter of its original starting models rounded down. Large unit. A unit composed of many warriors is much less likely to turn tail and run. So it gets a plus one for every 10 models. Phalanx. Phalanx is outside of the advanced rules. It is its own chapter because it's misunderstood in some ways. 
They even had a couple of erratas for this. It's a special formation of infantry whereby all warriors in the unit would be arranged in tight rows. Those at the front would be lock their shields together to form an impenetrable wall with each shield protecting both its bearer and partially the man to his left. The ranks behind would lend their weight to those in front with their phalanx crashing against another. Such confrontations becoming pushing matches as much as the slaughter. The spear with the long spear, they were able to thrust above the heads to those in front to stab the enemy. So they're saying the guys in the back could reach over the guys in front and stab the guys in front of them. Thus, an approaching enemy was confronted with a fortress of spears. The only reasonable method of attack was to employ a fortress of spears of their own preferably with more men. It was the Greek hoplite who adopted the widespread use of the phalanx as the main method, and his equipment reflected this manner of fighting. A large round shield protected the wide surface area, providing protection for both the hoplite and his neighbor, while the long spear allowed him to attack enemies who were not right in front of him. A sword could be employed if the spear was broken or lost, or if the press of the men between the two opposing forces was too tight to use it effectively. The sword was perfect for stabbing or slashing at the enemy, particularly if the blows were aimed below the row of shields. Metal greaves to protect legs followed this tactic quickly. Finally, the enclosed helmet was invaluable as half a dozen or more spear points could be thrust at a single warrior at any one time, and he would not rely on his shield to, or reflexes to avoid them. Most thrusts would be deflected by the curved surface of the helmet, and only a truly unlucky stab to the eyes or mouth would prove lethal. Now let's talk about the game. War bands and SPQR are not massive armies and have fewer men than a single phalanx would in large in large force. You're looking at like 80 men or more, 120 men in one phalanx. But even a handful of men can benefit from this discipline of the phalanx and its protection. Using a phalanx. Certain units in a warband list, later in the book, are listed as being able to use the phalanx rule. You must have 10 models or more. So this could not form a phalanx. But if this was all one big giant unit, it would be allowed to form phalanx because it had 10 or more models. They would go base to base to form a wall of shields. So if you were separated like that at the start of your turn, you're obviously not in a phalanx. When it's your turn, you can move where everyone is base to base with no gaps I think you get the idea be arranged in ranks of at least five models each the final rank at the rear of the unit may have less than five models so boop boop now I couldn't I can't do this that's not a phalanx you have to have at least so he could be there that's at least five models each. The final rank at the rear may have less than five models. So he could be there. That's a phalanx, six and six. That's also a phalanx because each rank has at least five models and the last rank can have less than five models. Or you could go with this and make it like that, because then you get, it looks better that way, but it doesn't have to be that way. Facing. A phalanx has a facing, and all models in the phalanx must face the same direction. Failure to do so removes phalanx. Okay, facing is 45 degrees, left, right, 
So this unit's got a front here and there. It's got a side there and a rear here and there. You get the idea. Movement. A phalanx may only be moved forward into its front facing without any models turning or pivoting in any way. It may drift to one side or another, but every model in the unit must remain within the front facing of the original position. A phalanx always moves with a minus one to its move score. Let's move this building out of the way just so you can see what I'm talking about. That is the front arc of the phalanx. It can drift. This guy cannot go out like this, like a wheel, like in Napoleonics. You cannot wheel a phalanx. That is not, that is not allowed. Okay, we got the original position. We got the original position. Okay, the phalanx, I know I've got some facing in the back, but don't worry. We got the phalanx facing forward like this. Now you can drift, but you can't, you can drift as long as when you're done moving, everybody has the same front parallel facing with no wheeling. Now you'll notice I drifted a little bit to the left. That's fine. I can drift quite a bit to the left, actually, if I wanted to kind of get in front of these Romans. But the drift, when you're done moving, every model in the phalanx has to be in the front. Right? Okay. So if I, if I drifted... Now, I'm measuring from the front unit, but when I'm done measuring, I'm making sure that the back unit is in the front. So it's really a little bit less than 45 degree arc. Because if, if I truly drifted at a 45, this guy would be going down the ruler, right? And that is not allowed. He has to be inside the front arc when you finish. Wholly in the front arc, not partially. Ranged attacks. Phalanxes may make shooting attacks as normal, but only against targets in its front facing. However, a phalanx makes a very good target as it's tightly packed and it cannot avoid incoming missiles. You get a plus one bonus to range checks. In addition, the phalanx may only parry ranged attacks with its shields from its front facing. So a phalanx actually limits its ability to defend themselves because it's a large target. First of all, that's another minus a plus one to hit. And then being a phalanx is another plus one to hit. And if you were shooting at them from over here, they wouldn't get the parry from their shields. During a melee action, a phalanx is not required to move as many models as possible into contact with the enemy unit as other units do. As the strength of the phalanx comes in part from the weight of its men behind the front row. However, it must always try to get as many models in the front rank into contact as possible, but need not break, break the front rank to do so. If the phalanx is armed with long or very long weapons and is charged by cavalry models in the front, those weapons gain the lethal special rule against cavalry. Defense. A phalanx is obviously quite unwieldy on the battlefield. However, units that adopt it gain the following advantage. Plus one bonus to bravery checks. Gets a plus one bonus to all armor checks from the front. Enemy units in the phalanx front facing suffer a minus one to all ranged and melee checks they make against the phalanx. I know that sounds funny because the phalanx is tight, so you get a plus one to hit them. But if you're shooting at them from the front, you get a minus one, so it balances that out. Breaking a phalanx. A phalanx may be broken at any time 
by performing a move or melee action that takes any of the models out of contact with one another. In addition, a phalanx is also broken if it is charged by an enemy in close combat from any facing other than forward. All models must stay in ranks of five or more or the phalanx will be broken. So let's say we're in a unit like this and they do two casualties. One, two, slide him up, he's good. But if he did three casualties, now it's not in a phalanx. All right, let's talk about equipment and armor. We kind of glazed over this a little bit, but let's go pretty specific here. You have axes, clubs, daggers, fists and feet, great axe, large club, long spear, pike, short spear, sword, and two-handed sword. And every one of those, there's like a how many of them? One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's 11 of them. They each have their own special rules on page 24. An axe is lethal one, where a club is smasher, where fists and feet are considered short and weak. A great axe is two-handed, but it's also lethal two and a smasher and various things like that. So you would look at the rule book, you would see that there's special rules, which we already went over what those do, and these are the weapons and which special rule they have. Ranged weapons. There are bows, javelins, slings, and stones. A bow has a 20 inch range, but no special ability other than you can fire twice, you know. Then you got javelin, which uh, only has a 10 inch range, but it's lethal too. And it's a one shot, so when you use it, you're done. Slings are lethal one, which makes them more penetrating than a bow, but they're considered slow, so they have to be, they can only be fired once a turn. But they have a 30 inch range, so they shoot the farthest. Okay, now it's armor. Only one type of ar armor and carry a single shield. Some types of armor are heavy and cumbersome and so inflict a penalty on move. Now when you go into your units and you're buying armor and weapons for your units, uh, you pay, like this unit would pay 24 denarii per model. So this guy's 24, he's 24, he's 24. That's 96 points right there. But it says what they come with. He comes with chain shirt, large shield, and a sword. And that's already added into his stats. But if you wanted to, I could add slings. Now here's the trick. If I add a sling, I'm, I know I'm getting into army lists, but if I add a sling for three points, I don't just go to three points. It's three points per model in the unit. You cannot opt to only give him a sling. You have to give the same equipment to everybody. So that would be 12 more points. All right. So armor, they go as far as animal skin, arrow apron, bucklers, chainmail, cuirass, helmet, large shield, leather armor, linothorax, lorica segmentata, scale armor, small shield. Note that a helmet cannot be combined with other types of armor except a shield. Because armor is assumed to have helmets built in. So if you look, a helmet gives you plus zero, plus, um, zero to move, which means it's not a penalty. But it, all, but it does give you a plus one armor save. So you'd save on a five and a six. Where if you had leather armor... It's also plus zero move and a plus one armor. You cannot wear leather armor and a helmet to get the plus two. It's assumed that the leather armor and the helmet have the same protection. A chain shirt is minus one move and plus three armor. 
and that's why this legionary has a five move and plus three armor. Large shields don't provide armor, they provide something completely different. Let's just talk about shields. A large shield grants its carrier a parry of two. And if a unit carrying a large shield flees from combat, it must make a bravery check. If it fails, it drops its shields. And some of the other armors do kind of the same things like arrow aprons, uh, trap arrows and sling stones providing an extra measure of defense for the legs, rerolled failed armor checks. Okay. Equipment. There's barding. That's armor for your horse. There's a camel. There's a horn. There's um, the actual horse. There's Pila, which some of the Romans are allowed to get. There's a standard. Okay, what a standard, any unit within 12 inches can reroll failed bravery checks. The horn, the use of a horn allows the unit to stay coordinated and allows it to perform sometimes quite complicated actions. Once per battle, a unit that has at least one model with a horn may perform a third action in its phase. Pila, one of the signature weapons of the Rome, was the pilum. The pila may only be used once in every battle by a unit not already engaged in close combat against an enemy that is moving into close combat with it. So it's like a counterattack as you charge. Basically, it eliminates the bonus for charging and may not use any small or large shield to parry in the first melee action of the close combat. So it sticks into the shield, weighing it down. You can't heft it back up to, to parry the counterattack. All right, and that is the end of the rules for uh, part one and part two. So now you know a little bit about the armor, the weapons, how close combat works, how the phalanx works, will to fight, uh, heroic challenges and charging, and everything. All right, in the next video, I'm going to go into the campaign and some of the talents for the heroes.